Okay. Prova? Sì, funziona, funziona, ok. No, troppo scuro, troppo scuro, fai due. Due. Sì, sì. Ehm... Noi siamo pronti. Sì. Faccio la presentazione, se vuole. Okay. E con il suo pointer. Proviamo a vedere se funziona. Non è questa. Sì, 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 ma eh, poi c'è la prima presentazione. Funziona? Funziona, perfetto. Ok. Benvenuti a tutti. Welcome, everyone, to the 2024 Italian Symposium, day two. We are here with uh, Paolo Nespoli, a uh, former European Space Agency astronaut. He's going to tell us all about uh, his career and his experience uh, in space. Um, thank you very much for being here. We're really 
glad to have you here at the 2024 Italian Symposium. And here with uh, him, there's uh, Valeria Dosso, who's going to moderate the event after Mr. Uh, Paolo Nespoli uh, presents, uh, does his presentation about his career. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vuoi dire qualcosa? Quindi facciamo in italiano? No, no, in English, 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 right? Unless everybody speaks Italian here, no? In English, yeah, yeah. English, okay, <laughs> all right. Well, you have to bear with my Texan English. So I take my horse and I go for a ride. Okay, okay, andiamo avanti così. Houston, Houston. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to present you as well because it's such an honor to have you here today and of speaking. I'm in the middle, I don't know where to look. <laughs> it's like a university lecture room in a way, but it's a weird shape. Well, um, okay. In, in which direction is the uh, your like recording? Ah, because you have uh, you have also. Oh, okay, the camera is there. Okay. So it's an hour speaking to a pioneer of space exploration, and Paolo spent more than three hundred and thirteen days in space, and contributed significantly to our understanding of life beyond Earth, and also to the construction of the International Space Station. So today we'll hear more about his experience and we'll also have some time to ask some questions. So please, Paolo, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you. Thank you to you for being here today. We have until six o'clock, right? Yes. And who's going to keep the time? I will. <laughs> well, okay, very good. So, um, yes, the, the title that was given to me for the, the presentation is Beyond Earth the experience of an Italian astronaut. So I'm going to tell you a little bit how, I'm sorry, I have to give the shoulder to. No, no, fammi andare qua. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, um, yes, if, if I have to talk about space, the first thing that I would like to mention this is my synthetic CV. There's a lot of stuff uh, written in there, but one of the things that I like to point out too is the fact that I do have a an engineering degree. And this is kind of interesting because when I'm discussing with my wife, once in a while she stops me in the middle of the discussion and says, mm, you're really an engineer. I don't know what that means, but something means something. So. Pay attention or be careful because you are talking, you are hearing things from a, an engineering point of view. I don't pretend to be a philosopher, uh, an economist or things like this. I'm just an engineer. Uh, as uh, Valeria said, I was lucky enough to become an astronaut and I was lucky enough to fly to flew, to fly three times in space, the first time with the space shuttle and then with the Soyuz to the space station for a total of 313 days in space. So. If I have to talk about space, I usually think about something like this. This picture, it's a picture made in 69 during the first mission to the moon. This person here, this human here inside the suit is Buzz Aldrin because the picture was taken by Neil Armstrong. In fact, if you see Neil Armstrong reflected on the, on the visor of the suit, uh, and when Neil Armstrong uh, decided, because the crew decided to build the the logo of the mission, they come up with this logo, this patch in uh, in in, uh, in English in America. You you can sit down, uh, Valeria, if you want. I mean, you can stay, but, yeah, I but think I can stay, but I don't mind. whatever. Yes, <laughs> and uh, so that's the patch of the mission. It's kind of interesting because I like to look at this patch. And I am amazed because this today, since since then, practically all the patches have uh, some drawing, some symbology of the mission. They have the name of the mission, as you can see there, it says Apollo 11. But normally they have the name of the astronauts and some flags. And this patch does not have any name of the astronauts nor any flag. And when Neil Armstrong uh, put his uh, foot on the moon, 
he could have said, I'm Neil Armstrong, I'm going to the moon. Hey, I I donate this to the to my country, the United States. But in fact, he said something fairly interesting, which is uh, it's a small step for a man, a giant leap for mankind. It's slightly out of focus, so it's my eyes. But oh, anyhow, it's a small step for a man, a giant leap for mankind. And it's kind of interesting because the fact that there was no reference to any person nor to any country in all of this made everybody that were alive at that time and everybody who owned at that time a TV was glued to look at this uh, thing that was broadcast in real time. Everybody felt taken to the moon. And I was a little kid at that time, more or less like this. This is a picture that was taken when I was in uh, at the end of my elementary school. And, uh, and so when people would ask me, Paolo, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I was like, mm, of course, what do I want to do? I want to be an astronaut, of course. And, uh, and after a while, you know, I, I, I saw that the, the people would look at me and kind of say, yeah, study, you will, you will become an astronaut. In fact, uh, what are the chances you think that a little guy from the middle of nowhere in the 60s or 70s could fly in space, go to the moon? Very, very little. But I was persistent and I said, not only I want to go to the moon, I want to go to the moon because I want to go on the lunar rover and do cartwheels on the moon. And uh, and so people will look at me a little bit like this and they will say, oh, stud, you will go. Then they would turn around thinking this guy is kind of, a, his head is spinning out, out of control. So uh, I was really trying to figure out because as you know, what we think when you are a kid, not necessarily is feasible, not necessarily makes sense, not necessarily works out, and you need to find your way. And I was trying to kind of decide this thing. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, when I continue with my studies and after the middle school, I went to high school, I still remember the uh, philosophy professor, she was telling us, you know, life she would say, life is like a, a, a trip through a forest. You are born in this side of the forest. You have to find your way somewhere there. Try not to hit any tree and go the other side. And the future is, your future is there. But the problem is that there was no, no road. It's that like, yeah, but where is the road? Well, you have to find this. It's, it's, it's right there. You can, you can find it. And, you know, she said, watch out, because some people are capable and lucky. You need both of those things. And 20 years old, they are already rich and famous. But most of us, you know, doesn't work like that. They, 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 they kind of get in there. They get lost. They hit a, a tree. They lay on the floor for, for quite some time before they actually wake up or they lose uh, the the direction, sense of direction, they keep going in the forest for the rest of our of their life. So she was discussing this thing, uh, trying to explain to us life using using the the forest analogy. And uh, I was listening to this, but in fact, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I would see the forest not like that, but I would see it like this, uh, kind of dark, and not only that. There's no audio, but if there would be audio, you would hear both the thunderstorm and the, the wolf. Uh, which, which kind of told me, you know, I don't know if I want to, you know, try to cross this tank. I should, you know, should stay safe and sound this way. It's much easier than try to find my way in there. And in fact, while I was trying to figure out what to do when I grow up, I even uh, decided to put this uh, seed of wanting to be an astronaut in a little drawer, close the drawer and forget about it. Uh, I 
while I was trying to to really figure out what I want to do, and when I grow up, I I received the we are talking about the seventies. Uh, in Italy, there was a compulsory military service, so I received the used to be called the postcard from the the Ministry of Defense uh, calling me in the army. So I decided to go in the paratrooper, and I end up in uh, in uh, Pisa, uh, where there was the military school of paratrooper, and I was, you know, jumping off plane, doing kind of crazy things. And uh, somehow I kind of liked it. I liked it so much that at the end of this year of uh, military service, I decided to stay. And even, even that, I, I started working for the special forces, doing all sorts of crazy, strange things. And, uh, and it happened that in 82, from 82 to 84, I was deployed to Lebanon, where there was going on something that is going on right now in Gaza, same thing, same situation. The only thing is that instead of being in Gaza, I was in Beirut, but the situation was the same. And we were trying to give support to the population and inside the Palestinian camps. Um, so we had this, this kind of interesting situation. It's kind of interesting today that I see that you know, 30 years later or 40 years later, we are back to square one again. So uh, eventually after a year and a half, the situation got so bad that the Italian government decided to pull us out because we were trying to be a peace uh, contingent in a place where peace, where nobody wants peace, which is kind of different, difficult. Uh, it's a little bit like what's happening now in Gaza. You know, the the the, the Palestinians don't want to give the the hostages. The Israelis don't want to give. Eh, so the situation very very complicated. And this was exactly complicated like that. And when and when we left uh, Lebanon, we were on a ship going back to Italy, and somebody asked me. At this moment, it was a pretty heavy heavy duty moment. Somebody asked me so. Paolo, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was kind of, you know, taken aback because at this point I felt I was already grown up. I had, from a, a simple soldier, I had become an under warrant officer. I was an officer. I was in the special forces. So I had already, you know, do part of my career that was very difficult to do was an exception that I was supposed that I that I was able to be there and uh and so I simply reply look I'll be a special forces operator for the rest of my life you know I'm already 27 can I change my life now you know but but this person told me you know if you have a dream if you had a dream when you were a kid are you sure you decided that you cannot do it you should try to do it. You should pull up this dream and try to make it happen. And uh, I actually uh, let her talk about this one. And uh, but at that time, I think it was like, let me see the title in English. Eh? Like something that was just something that went into my brain and start chewing up the thing. So the little animal that chew up the 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 wood, no. No, wood, wood, woodworm, bravo, woodworm. So I had a, I had a brain worm, uh, meaning that this uh, woodworm in my brain was cut, actually chewing up. And, you know, a couple of months later, I kind of said, yeah, you know what, I can, I can try. So what I did, I, I did a little bit of research, figuring out what were the requirements that were going to ask for people that would apply to the astronaut corps. And uh, at that time, there were no Italian astronauts. We knew that Italy or the Italian Space Agency would make a selection shortly. And I managed to figure out that they would use the same, uh, the same 
things that were requested by NASA astronauts. So I looked at it and uh, it turns out that I needed to have a good health status. I needed to be not crazy, good psychological status. I need to have some anthropometric measures, meaning that if I was like two meters and 20 or one meter 50, probably I would not have uh, met the, the, the characteristics. Uh, but then they are two. So I went to look for these things and figure out that, for example, from the anthropometric point of view, the maximum height, because everybody was telling me, oh, you are too tall. And uh, when I went and looked at the characteristics and I found that NASA uh, height limit was six feet and three inches, which is about one meter 90. I'm 188.5. So barely below the one meter 90 so it was okay i had decent health status i had a decent psychological status but they would require also knowledge of english english language and knowledge at a business level not just school level and they require a technical degree university technical degree and uh, some other conditions and i had none of these things i could i didn't speak english because I studied French in high school, so 27, don't speak English. I don't have a technical degree. I don't have any of the other things. So I decided to go back and try to get this, uh, these qualifications. So I enrolled, I, I keep going, right? I, I enrolled at the school in, uh, in the United States because I had this brilliant idea. If I tried to do a degree in the United States, either they kick my butt, or I will learn English and I get a degree. Not only that, the degree in the United States at that time, they were very fluid, meaning that you could, the Americans did not care. You want to do 20 classes? Okay, if you can do 20 classes, you can pass 20 classes, no problem. And since I was a little bit in a rush to catch up with all the time that I lost, I kind of adopted this uh, technique of uh, doing daily courses, evening courses, summer courses, winter courses. So when all the others were sitting there doing something else, I was doing courses. And I had, uh, I had, I took, it took four years for me to do a bachelor of science and a master of science, which normally takes six years. So at the end of the four years, I was, uh, I was an engineer. I could speak English. Uh, I, here is the, picture of me with a degree with the twin tower there were still the twin tower at that time and uh uh came back to italy and uh, sure enough immediately the italian space agency made the first call for the first astronaut so i applied i speak english i am below the thing i'm not crazy i hope uh this kind of things uh, so i applied and I got to the last selection. So they had me going back and forth to Rome. They even sent us to San Diego for some selections with the American. And at the end of all of this process, I got a telegram at that time. They used to inform you about the result of this selection with the telegram. So I got this yellow telegram and it said something like, congratulations, you have reached the final stages of the selection but you have not been selected. So, eh? a bit misleading. A, a bit misleading. I could not figure it out. There's the logic of this. Congratulations, you're not being selected, but okay, fine. So I kind of, you know, destroyed this telegram, throwing it away and, uh, and uh, said, okay, it did not go through. So I started working as an engineer, first in Italy and then at the European Space Agency. In fact, strangely enough, there was a position open at the European Astronaut Center. They were looking for an astronaut training engineer. I applied and they actually selected me. So I moved uh, to Cologne in Germany and my job was training astronauts, was preparing the, the, the training curricula and things like that, the courses for the astronauts. And in 1992, there was another selection. So I apply again, and there we go, going back and forth, up and down. And finally, the, tele the telegram comes again and says, congratulations, you've been 
you arrive to the last phases of the selection, but you have not been selected. So that was non-selection number two. And it was starting getting kind of heavy being rejected in this thing. So somebody else was preferred. But I kept, uh, I kept going and I waited for another selection again, which happened when I was almost, actually, I, I was already 40 and I was outside of the preferred selection age of the astronaut, 27, 37. I was 40. So from the Italian Space Agency, they told me don't apply because you are already too old. Uh, we will not take you, but I, I applied anyhow. And eventually when I got the telegram, the third telegram, what did he say? That they accepted you. Congratulations. You got to the last phases. And, uh, and, and I was kind of, kind of, okay, I'm going to throw it away again. And then it says, and you have been selected. So exactly the same as before, only the known was missing. So maybe it was, they were saving ink. I'm not quite sure, but okay. So, and, and I would like to ask you a question just regarding this, since we are in the theme. Um, I think that your journey of becoming an astronaut in the end, it's kind of a clear example of how perseverance can lead to success and you didn't give up. So I was wondering if you could share with us, how did you not lose like hope in your dream of becoming an astronaut after this, finding these obstacles? Well, uh, that's kind of a difficult, difficult question because it's not that, you know, I have something that I can pull out and say, I use this. You know, it, it was becoming an astronaut was a, a, an impossible dream. I could not believe I could not be selected. In fact, I was quite disappointed when they did not select me. But, you know, when, when we do something and things don't go the way we want, what do we do normally? What do you do? Just give up? No, we keep going. I mean, but not... keep going. Uh, yes, you keep going because you have to live. But it you know, depends on what type of person you are, I guess. The, the, yeah, but the way I look at it, I looked at it as a mistake. So, the the question that I ask myself is: I was not selected. What did I do? Evidently, I've done something wrong, and uh, I actually figure out there were a lot of things that, as an engineer, I was not considering. For example, there was. Uh, you know, networking, there was a lot of other stuff that contribute to the selection. Not only that, I, I sympathize with the committee that I had to select uh, because, you know, you, you get hundreds of candidates and you take away all the guys that don't fit, but then eventually you still have 20, 30, 50 candidates that, and you have to select one. How do you select one? You will you will be at the same situation when eventually you will be boss of a company and you will have to interview somebody to hire to see if, who you can hire and you're going to interview you know 10 people or now it's the opposite you get interview and there are some other some other people competing with you so how do you how do you make yourself being selected it's something that is not quite easy. There is not a solution that, you know, you can pull out from the pocket and say, okay, if you do this, you're going to be selected. It doesn't work like that. There's a lot of, a lot of things. And so I looked at it and uh, I decided that in my second selection, uh, during the last interview, during the last phase, they, they had the last interview, one of the, 10 people that were there, the committee asked me about the dynamics of a satellite. No, pretty complex question. So what does the satellite do if it flies in a certain way? And, you know, I, I would say that I more or less knew it, but I did not know it really precisely. So I find myself there trying to explain something and not able to explain it the way that, that I would have uh, wanted so so i decided that the reason why they did not pick me is because i was not fluent in this thing and and i said if there were ever would be another selection i will study this like there is no tomorrow so 
So when I heard there was a third selection, I took the books, I took all the equations, I derived myself the equation of motions, all the sort of things. I made sure that I knew exactly how to answer the question in a fluent manner. So I was ready when I got in the, in the, in the thing and I was expecting them to ask me technical questions. Huh? It didn't. One of the one of the the they were tired out there. I don't know how many interviews they had already. They were tired. One of the guy kind of to break the ice, he said, So, Paolo, what are your hobbies? And I was not, you know, prepared for this. And I said, hey, you know, I like photography. But I I I I said it just like this. And sure enough, I must have touched something that was interesting for the guy because we started discussing about photography and we discuss and discuss, 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 discuss. And at a certain point I, I figured out, damn it, I lost track of time. I know we had 45 minutes here, been discussing photography for more than half an hour. So, you know, I think they already decided that I'm not qualified or something and they don't care to hear my technical description. So I can kind of stop and say, hey, okay about photography, but when do we talk about the satellite, the other things? And the guy said, no, no, we have already enough information. And they just threw me out. And I thought, okay, that's it. I burned my last opportunity to becoming an astronaut. And sure enough, I was selected. So a few months later, I met by chance one of these guys that wasn't there. And I said, hey, can you you know, I cannot understand. You did not ask me anything technical, anything like this. We talked about photography. And uh, how did you decide to pick me? He said, well, you know, we wanted, we knew that all of you knew about this technical stuff. But we really wanted to feel the personality of people, not people saying rules, uh, uh technical things we wanted to see the soul and Enjoy the confidence of the person and you you actually said you actually took us in the strip with photography and everybody was kind of impressed and they decided to pick you so it's kind of interesting so today somebody asked me what what do you think made you stand up between other hundreds of candidates. There were like kind of 2,000 people in that selection. And, and I would say, well, strange. It's not space. It's not something. It's photography. Because when you will be, when you will go for your interview, the first interview, can you show you are a good, maybe you can show you are a decent student, but, you know, being a student, one thing, being able to work is another thing. And and what they are looking for, yes, is people that are capable of studying, but people that eventually they will want to work with. You know, if you are hard-headed, if you make you show that you don't understand or you don't want to hear, or you talk continuously over the people that want to ask you things, that shows already something about you, something that will make you not being desired as an employee. So think a lot about this one, okay? And what, what? so this is what happened with me. I mean, I was selected because I started talking about photography, which is kind of interesting, but I knew about the satellite, by the way. So can I keep going? Yeah, or? Where did, ah, here. Uh, so here we are at the last selection, Houston, 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 we have a problem. Oh, wait a second. Oh, no. Wait. Ah, there it is. Maybe the mouse. No, maybe. Yes. So, uh, so 1998, I've been selected to the Astronaut Corps. At that time, it was the year where the European Space Agency decided to make a unique, a unified astronaut core in Europe. There were a lot of, of astronauts, uh, four French, five Germans, three Italians, one Spanish, one Swedish, one Swiss, no British. Uh, 
coming from all sort of uh, interesting position, five from the armed forces, nine civilians, four pilots, seven physicists, three engineers, one medical doctor, 14 males, one females, very few females, but okay. And um, when I showed up uh, the next day at the European Astro Center again, they told me, Paolo, we cannot train you here in Europe as astronaut because as astro as uh, for human spaceflight, we don't have any vehicle. This was 1998, and even today we don't have any any vehicle. So if we want to launch an astronaut in space, we need to go to the United States or Russia or China. China we never went, but we went to Russia or the United States, and uh, and so they they sent me to NASA. And NASA put me with the 18th or 17th class of astronaut called the penguin, called the penguins. Uh, here is the mascot of the of the class is this penguin. And we quite never figure out why they gave us the mascot, the penguins, that was given to us by the class before us. And uh, we did not realize until we, we understand that a penguin is officially a bird, but it cannot fly because it has small wings. So I said, oh, you know, it's a kind of an interesting situation. You have a lot of astronauts in front of you. It's going to take quite some time before you get qualified. It takes two years to get qualified to fly on the, on the space shuttle and things like this. And one of the things that I immediately understood because I, I really, I, when I was selected, I said, okay, it's my chance to, you know, go to the moon and do a cartwheels in the lunar rover. But then I realized the 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 moon, do you know how far away is the moon from earth? It's more or less 380,000 kilometers. So it's quite far away. But since 1972, we never went to the moon. So there were in late 60s, early 70s, there were six, six missions that successfully landed on the moon, bringing 12 human beings uh, stepping on the moon. But aside for those missions, we never went really far away. We all stayed in what is called the low LEO or low Earth orbit that goes from 200 to 1,000 kilometers. So when we fly in space, we just go outside the atmosphere and stay relatively close to Earth. We don't go as far as the moon because, you know, it takes fuel. It takes a lot of uh, complication to get out there. So we stay we stay here. And uh, uh, what the Americans uh, designed, the vehicle that the Americans designed for going on low Earth orbit was the space shuttle, which, by the way, if you look at it a little bit precisely, you figure out that the, uh, this this guy here is the fuel tank. And uh, there is enough fuel tank there to make the whole system like an atomic bomb, a mini atomic bomb. So when when you are when you are launching, you are sitting actually laying on the atomic bomb, strapped to the atomic bomb, and then there is nobody around for five kilometers, which is because if this thing blows up, you are blown to smithereens, and you have to wear special suits and things like this. So it's a fairly complicated system to handle. Uh, it requires a lot of training. In fact, what NASA figures out that they would concentrate on were in professional competencies, technical competencies and procedural competencies, meaning meaning how people are able to react to situation. Yes, you are, I don't know, medical doctor, you have a technical degree, but are you able to pilot the shuttle or make, I don't know, the robotic arm work? So these are technical skills that are actually trained. And in fact, we started training with a lot of theoretical lessons. At the beginning, relatively simple, uh, simple practical training with simulators. Then the simulator got more and more complicated. We had a lot of laboratory training with, you know, strange laboratory. Here is metallurgy. Here is it's a medical laboratory. Here is a, one of my colleagues building a power supply with a 
with some you know a soldering iron and some uh electronic part so you have to do you have to learn to be proficient in all of these things this is just some of them and we had some general lectures and discussion this guy here in the middle with the light blue shirt is actually neil armstrong and neil armstrong came to our class and gave us a seminar on what it, it meant going to the moon be part of the x-15 project you know do, do all this sort of things like that uh we did uh do some what nasa called the field trips so they send us quote unquote in vacation these are in new mexico with uh with a professor talking about geology talking about rocks because you know if they send you to the moon and they tell you to pick up some rocks you better pick up five different rocks and not the same rock five times. Um, then they wanted us to be in a kind of a strange situation to understand that we can bear certain weird stuff. Uh, so we had to do water survival where they, they dumped us in the middle of the Gulf, Me Gulf uh, Mexican Gulf. And, they, and then we did water survival as they dumped us in a forest in north uh, north of the United States, almost in Canada, and where we survived for a few days there with almost nothing. It was kind of interesting. Uh, then NASA has a fleet of uh, trainer, which are military trainer, and uh, usually they put you in the back in front. They, they put a pilot, could be a, a shuttle pilot. They put you in the back and they let you fly this this thing, which is kind of an interesting plane because it's because uh, it can fly supersonic, too, so it's complicated to fly. But this is a, a, a perfect uh, system to train you on practical things to see how you react when you have to fly, talk to the control center, decide what to do, what not to do. A mistake on, on this thing could have uh, resulted in you being excluded by the astronaut corps in the astronaut course. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, then we had some kind of simulation with the whole crew. The problem is that if when you put your suit on, suit on with gloves, you start losing sensitivity with your hands. When you put the helmet on, you are inside the, the aquarium, you are the fish. And the problem is that if you talk, nobody else can talk. So you need to learn a little bit of discipline Otherwise, nobody understands everything and anything. And this is this is a problem. Uh, then eventually, and it took quite several years, uh, so they were right, the guys that called us the penguins, because it took me almost nine years before being assigned to a shuttle flight. In fact, it was STS, Shuttle Transportation System 120. The name of the, of the shuttle was Discovery. This is the crew. It's kind of interesting because if you look carefully, you can see two, four, six American astronauts and one foreigner, which is kind of interesting because, well, you know, you are a foreigner with six astronauts, six American astronauts. The program is there, so it, it can be interesting. But they, they, they launched us in space. We had to do something fairly complex. And uh, before launching in space, it took us almost a year of training because we needed to train specifically for that mission. So here's the commander, Pamela Merroy. Today, she's the number two at NASA, by the way. Uh, um, Georgia was the pilot. I was the mission specialist, so the board engineer. Uh, uh, we had to learn to work together for doing some activities. This is one of them. Um, we needed to work on the robotic arm to, to move this crane in space. Uh, we needed to work about space walks, and we did that training in, uh, in a pool in Houston. So it took quite some time, but eventually... I mean, it took a year and a half. Eventually, we were ready. And this is the picture taken when we went out from the isolation crew quarters to go to the shuttle and be launched in space. I show this picture because 
if you look carefully, everybody's kind of smiling. Because, you know, a, a lot of people ask me, Paolo, but when you were going to be strapped on the atomic bomb, were you afraid of something? And I showed this picture saying, yeah, you don't see anybody cry. You don't want to go to the atomic bomb. So it's a moment where, you know, 10 years of training is finally, uh, finally giving some results. You are going to, you're going to fly in space. Yes, it's risky, but there is a lot of uh, uh, faith on what the other people can do. And they have faith on you too. So when there is this kind of, uh, of confidence, then you don't have, you don't have, you're not scared because everybody's going to do his, his job. And so I, I finish here. Because... Yeah. I just wanted to ask you something regarding exactly the, just the picture that you just showed, because I we've seen that you did a lot of practical and technical preparation to go on your mission. But I was wondering, did you do also any mental and like psychological preparation as well to get it with like the practical aspect? Something. That's a very interesting question, Valeria, because uh, NASA at that time realized they were missing something. They were missing something. So I showed you what they were training for, those competencies. Yeah. Uh, but but those competencies were exactly for the space shuttle. But this mission came towards the end of, of the space shuttle. And the, the Americans started flying long duration on the space station and they realized something was missing. And this, the preparation for this flight had some of these elements, but not yet defined. NASA was still studying this one. We will see it, we will see in a little one, little while what happened. So so this is the, the moment of the launch. In fact, we, we flew in space. We were supposed to stay 12 days, we stayed 15. We had a major malfunction during the flight. We had to solve, we had to call Houston. We have a problem also to things like that. It was actually a very complex mission. And uh, and when we landed, after we landed at Cape Kennedy, uh, they told us, the last thing they told us on the radio, there will be a surprise tomorrow when you come back to Houston. And when we landed the next day in Houston, there was the president of the United States. He came with Air Force One. Mm -hmm landed congratulations the nation is grateful for what you have done you risk your life to for these things and you know said hello to everybody jump back on the plane and left so it was kind of interesting interesting thing so i would uh, i will stop i will stop here uh, valeria yeah. do you have questions or something a few questions and then we'll also give some time as well for more questions uh, the, the 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 presentation is not finished, huh? Yeah, if you want to keep going, you can keep going. Keep going. Later later on, we will keep going, but we'll take we'll take a few moments here. Yeah. Well, you talked also about uh, your degree, so you have a degree in aerospace engineering and also a master, right? Yes. So I was wondering how much of your degree uh, helped you become a successful engineer and also successful astronaut, better than the practical experience that you gained on the job and also throughout your whole your whole preparation. Well, I think NASA, in fact, uh, requests a technical degrees because they want you to have the basis clear. So when they are talking about science, uh, some kind of experiment, whatever it is, they assume you understand what was going on, or at least you are capable to understand enough to execute the procedure. Uh, and so they, they want you to have a technical degree, but if you are a medical doctor or an engineer or a physicist, they don't care because they will build on top of this everything that is necessary to round you up and being able to do all sorts of things. We will see later what astronauts do in space uh, at the end. And uh, and it's kind of interesting because I think without these degrees, most likely a skilled person would be able to be a decent astronaut. Uh, so I don't know. You know, today I do teach a course at the Polytechnic University in Milan to aerospace engineers, and a lot of them want to would like to become astronauts. And I cannot tell them 
a degree is not necessary, you know, because whatever you need to be done, you will be trained on, and uh, and the system will make sure that you know what what is required. Thank you. And also, we've seen that there is uh, all students coming from different space agencies as well. So I was wondering, how does the collaboration between members of dif different space agencies work on the International Space Station? Yes, this is uh, an interesting point because you know, as you see, as you see here. Oops. Yeah. Let me go back. Okay. Where am Where am I? In this picture, in the back, <laughs> in the back, almost you don't see me, uh, because you know the commander, the pilot, mission specialist, blah blah blah. So six American and a, and a foreign guy. So it's 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 kind of uh, interesting how you know when when you do work with uh, somebody else and somebody else is in charge of the operation, you have to be very good at what you're doing, but not necessarily you get to do things uh, because there is a lot of things on top of being uh, competent and capable more that, that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, but what was your question again? Um, how the collaboration with- Ah, the collaboration, yeah. yes. No, it's clear that when we were trying to, actually, when we were flying space, we did realize that, you know, each one of us had the capability of killing himself and the other member of the crew. Uh, but we had absolutely no doubt that nobody would do anything stupid, or at least they could do something stupid but as a mistake but then we had put in place some filters that would filter the mistakes that people do you know i i kind of show you the first picture the first picture i kind of show you the first picture of the training of the of the shuttle here it is so george and uh, pamela can easily work out the switches those are relatively simple to move but then you know when you're in space something very strange happens is that there is no more gravity and uh, your brain especially if you're flying on a short duration flight is kind of lost in trying to figure out all the simple things which things which here on earth we do not require brain power. So if I have to drink some water here, I don't, I just take the water and drink. But if I try to do the same thing in space, it can get complicated. The water doesn't stay there. I cannot throw it down in my stomach. So there are a lot of things that makes the brain busy processing this relatively normal information. So sometimes when you think you're doing something simple, you can easily make a mistake. And that happened to me, by the way, once in space, I, I was moving in a switch. You see, see there, there is a light, there is a light there. And uh, the light uses electricity as the electricity comes from generators. In order to uh, generate electricity, you need to use oxygen, but there is also, the oxygen is also used by the crew. So if you waste a lot of energies keeping the lights on when it's not necessary, then you have less time to be in space. And so one of the rules that we have, every time the light is on, it's not necessary that the light is on, you turn it off. So I was in, I was in the shuttle at a certain point, I was uh, uh, there alone, the light was on, I took my hand, how complicated it is to turn one light off, I turned it off and it did not turn off because I missed the switch. I, pulled a different switch i turned off a radio. what happened <laughs> i turned off a radio and um and when i went and look and i said damn it i turned off a radio now what do i do you know as an italian i would i would just say i don't care you know, somebody will figure out the radio is off but then you know i said that's not the way they taught us we need to work so i went to 
Pam. I looked for Pam. She was somewhere. And I said, Pam, I think I made a mistake. I switched off the radio. And she said, uh-huh. What did we say about not switching anything, even simple, without somebody else looking at you? And I said, yeah. But, you know, because you're keeping going into light, day and night, day and night, the light goes on, goes off, goes on, goes off. She understood and she said, okay, go on the emergency radio, call Houston and say that that you have a problem. So I, I picked up the emergency thing. I said, Houston, we accidentally turned off the radio. What should we do to recover it? And, and they gave me the procedure to, to figure out what to do, which is very interesting uh, because also then they, they kind of, looked at why somebody made a mistake so 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 simple and they figured out that because of the switch the light switch is actually exactly identical as the radio switch so they decided they should make it different so that by touch it you feel that is the right switch and that's what they did by the way see so even a stupid mistake generated something that was clean and that's what we should do we should try to do in life and not hide mistakes because we can always learn from mistakes it was kind of like a process also for them to understand how to improve these missions and also the shuttle itself yes 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 the the shuttle see all these pieces of papers all over the place shuttle is very complicated but then you still need a, a gazillion of procedure uh to make it work so at the end, what happened at the end of 2011, after the Columbia accident, a committee decided that the shuttle was too complicated and in fact, they canceled it. Yeah. It was an incredible, capable machine, but very complicated and very costly. And even the United States had difficulty to maintain it. So they actually... Uh, canceled it and what happened after 10 years I learned I got my wings to fly on the shuttle they canceled the vehicle so so I was about ready to fly on the shuttle again and they told me mm -mm, there's no more shuttle so uh, you can fly you will fly on a Russian vehicle uh, there's only one problem go to Russia learn Russian learn a new vehicle, and then when you qualify, when you get the wings, the Russian uh, wings, then we can fly you in space. And this is what I did. I went to Russia and learned to, to work on the Russian system, which is totally different than the American system. By the way, everything is in Cyrillic. The instructors are in Cyrillic, the control center is in Cyrillic. So it's very, very interesting. There are a few interesting things. So this is the launch of, our, of, our, of my first mission, and all the missions start from Baikonur, and this is the same launch pad that they used, the Soviets used to launch Yuri Gagarin 60 years ago. And so I can say I flew with the Soviets from the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin used as I launched with the shuttle on the same launch pad that the Apollo mission used to go to the moon. So very interesting. Uh, but then... You know, we went to fly. I pick up again the the, the 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 we went to fly. At that time, you know, our STS-120 was on one of the last missions to complete the space station. That was essentially complete. The last shuttle flew exactly when we were in orbit. In fact, this is uh, this is the one before last, and uh, it's still attached to the space station. And uh, and this is a picture of the space station. So I would like to spend a couple of words about the space station. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. If I would ask you and you don't know where is the space station, if I ask people that don't know where is the space station, I think most of the time I got I get the answer. Hey, it's on the moon. Is on is it on the moon? No, what is it, on Mars? It's on low Earth orbit. So it's relatively close to, to Earth, 
is between 200 to 1,000 kilometers. In fact, it's at about 400 kilometers uh, above sea level, meaning that it's outside the atmosphere, but it's not really far, far away because the farther you put it, the more fuel you need to go and get it, bring supplies, do things. Uh, the point, though, is that at that height, it has to fly at 28,000 kilometers per hour. You know how much, much is 28,000 kilometers per hour? It's about eight kilometers per second. So it means that it basically goes around the Earth multiple times during the day. You manage to see it how many times? Yes, we will, we will, we will mention it now. No, but the, the point that I want to make here is that the, the station is, is rotating in orbit around the Earth at 28,000 kilometers per hour. So a question that I have for you is, you are inside this, you will be inside the space station. Do you feel you are flying at 28,000 kilometers per hour? Would you feel? I don't think you would feel that. Why not? I mean, it's probably in a stationary orbit, is it? So also there's- Oh, no, like... you're, you're flying at 28,000 kilometers. So you're going, it's like you're going in a car at 28,000 kilometers. But it depends on the type of system of reference that you're using probably as well. Getting complicated. <laughs> yeah, no, what, what happens, actually the answer is relatively simple, is because nature gave us a lot of sensors. You know, we have eyes, we have ears, we have tongue, we have smell, we have a lot of things, but we don't have a sense of uh, speed. So if you are on a plane, and you ask your neighbors, what's the speed we are going? They're like, I don't Unless know. there's acceleration, but it seems like you're going at the same speed. Or... And that's and that's that's the point, which is actually very difficult to to understand. I mean, the station is actually flowing, flying around Earth, but what happens is that at this speed, twenty eight thousand uh, kilometers per hour, the station actually falls down because it's attracted by the scent by the Earth. But it, when it falls down, it falls around the corner, around your high zone. So the station is always in a free fall. And it's kind of an interesting situation because in this condition where you are free falling, you're not feeling gravity. You and anything else feels gravity. It's, Nevertheless, there is gravity in there. I remember I had a professor who actually told me that it's not exactly like an absence of gravity, but it's kind of like a system that has equal forces on each side, like the centrifugal acceleration. Yeah, so that's, that's a, yes, that's an engineering view, by the way. I'm an engineer, so that's yeah, probably so, fun. Because if you, if you talk like this to a physicist, they will say, no, 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 that doesn't, the centrifugal forces does not exist. Uh, in fact, what you're doing, you're falling, you're falling, 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 you keep falling forever. And in this condition where you're falling forever, so it's like you'll be sitting here, but there is nothing as a, as a floor. So you are just falling continuously. And this is what happens. And this, this is why we don't feel gravity. So uh, rotating at 28,000 kilometers per hour uh, makes this house work like a laboratory in micro g uh, because you don't feel you and everybody everything else doesn't feel gravity but then is also your house because you're finished to work at uh, during the day and then in the evening it's not that you can go home or go somewhere else so you you end up working or living in a space which is much smaller than half of this room and you are at six people and you live you work there 12 hours and you live there 12 hours and you go around earth in an orbital period, meaning you do a complete spin around the earth in about an hour and a half, which means that in an hour and a half, you have a sunset and a sunrise. So 16 sunsets, 16 sunrises per day, which is kind of interesting and somehow complicated but you are inside working so you don't see these things uh the the station is actually big this this truss is about uh 100 meters and the internal volumes where we are it's about 450 cubic meters which is about a room of about 100 square meters do you measure things here in square meters of course food but we have a 
uh, square footage here too. So 1,100 square foot. So relatively small house for six people. And uh, the last thing is that there are people from different countries, United States, Russia, 11 nations from Europe, Japan, and Canada. We all live and work together. It's kind of interesting situation because this is not anymore a, an American vehicle. It's an international vehicle made, made by all these countries. So, so the, the sharing of the tasks is kind of uh, different. So now, obviously, this is not a, a, a regular working place. Uh, and uh, what NASA had, had figured out after the first astronaut, NASA astronaut, flew in space, they figured out, yes, they need you. They need to look at professional competencies, technical competence, and procedural competence. But there was something else. They made the, they should train these people to work together. And what they come up with after a couple of years of study, they come up with what they call human behavioral competencies or soft skills. So talking about communication, teamwork, leadership, followership, situational awareness decision-making, problem-solving, cross-gender, cross-cultural awareness, self-care and self-management. These are things that are very important. If you don't take care of any of these things, you're going to be doomed. You're going to have troubles you know, to stay six months on the space station. So they figure out they need to train people in this kind of uh, things differently than their technical degrees. This is more... Uh, human behavioral competences. You can be the perfect engineer, but then can you work in team? Can you trust the other people? Can you do leadership, followership? Can you understand what was going on? Can you make good decision? Can you solve problems? So they decided to build what NASA calls uh, HBP, human behavior performance training, where they through us as a crew in strange situation that would take us, take something away from us and see how we work as a crew. For example, this is a picture that we took in Alaska. It was summer, as you can see. Uh, they, they put us in a little island in the middle of nowhere with five kayaks. And they, they told us, okay, we'll leave you here. We're, we are going to pick you up. Uh, in 15 days, 12, uh, or oh, actually in 12 days, 150 kilometers away. And our task was to find our way down there as a team. You know, you cannot say somebody, we don't, we don't like this guy. We just leave it in a little area. You know. And, you know, you had to find water. You had to be a, uh, uh, watch out for bears, you know, all sorts of crazy situations. You have to camp out, uh, kind of interesting things. But then, there were other situations like this one. This is one of them, one of the uh, situation where they put us in Wyoming, a high, uh, high altitude, about 3,000 meters, which makes it difficult to walk and uh, uh, ski. And we had to carry everything we, we needed for the 15 days of the simulation. And at night, we needed to build some shelter, otherwise... You will not survive with the temperature that goes minus 30 or something like this. Uh, in one of these trainings, have you ever found yourself in a very dangerous situation? Either you of one. Well, of your... all of these situations were kind of dangerous. You know, it's kind of like an extreme sport where, you know, you, you're doing something kind of crazy, but you think you know what you're doing. Uh, you pay attention now or you... Usually in this kind of situation where situation can go really bad, there is always an instructor, somebody that knows more than you know, and, in case, and usually they are quiet. Uh, but if you try to do something that they perceive as dangerous, they will stop you. And, uh, and this is what happens. So uh, here there's another one of this situation. This is a cave in Sardinia. Uh, this handled by the European Space Agency. They put us inside this cave, complex caves, about 30 kilometers of caves. And they told us, oh, you have a simple task. You have to find the exit. 
and we ran around inside the mountains for you know kilometers. This picture here was taken 2.5 kilometers inside the mountain. So it takes uh, you know 10 or 15 hours to get there. If you get injured in there, it's kind of very dangerous. How would they place you in a position inside the cave where you would not know where you are in order to get out? Well, no, we wouldn't know besides that we always had instructors. Mm -hmm. So if there is a, a serious problem, there is always an instructor. Uh, but uh, they, it's not that we don't know. This cave is kind of like straight. So we could, once you do it, you can trace back your, your way. You have the chance to know how you got there. But, but, you know, it's kind of interesting because one of the things that we learn in this situation is that you... You know, they gave us a task to find the exit, and we we said we will find the exit. And uh, when we started this part of the exploration, uh, it was more than ten hours from when we started in the morning. We were getting tired. Uh, we had no food. Uh, we we're getting cold because temperature is cold, wet, and and still you have this this will or want to explore this kind of. Uh, uh, would uh, what was it? A wood bug that would make you as want to explore, and you forget about the fact that you need to come back to the base camp, and it, it's going to take you. It took us ten hours to get there. It, it's going to take us another ten hours to get back to base camp. Passing through certain places that are really, really thin, really complicated. So you have to get to a point where they kind of show you that. You know, in certain cases, especially when you talk about exploration, our wanted to do something new is more than our capability of deciding, making good good decisions. And this is what they wanted us to to learn, and we learned in that things because at a certain point, the instructors stop us and said, "Hey guys, let's go back." They said, "No, come on, another little. Let's do another little." little thing and we actually had to come back so no i just wanted to say that we still have five minutes for the presentation and then maybe we can move to uh the questions from the audience as well yes so let's let me let me go fast so this is another one of training that we did underwater this is like 20 meters underwater where we go underwater and we stay underwater for 15 days so it's kind of into you sleep underwater, sleep every. There is a place, not that you sleep there in water. Uh, or there is a places where the Russians have this kind of interesting situation. They will throw you in the middle of the forest in winter. And then they say, okay, you can survive. And uh, of course, at night is minus 30. So Siberian education. It's kind of education. Actually, it serves two purposes. First of all, to, to show you that you can survive and second, that you have enough stuff that you can get smart on it to try to use the best of your capabilities to come up with all kind of trick and solution to be alive. Uh, some of the situation that kind of astonish you during training, the, the Russians kind of simulate a fire during, uh, uh, while you're flying the, the Soyuz spacecraft which is kind of an interesting situation because it's not that you can stop and say, okay, I want to go home. Uh, you are in space, so you need to find a way to deal with the fire. Uh, as you need to find a, a way to deal with the fire on the space station will happen once some years ago. Uh, there is also an emergency situation like the atmosphere could get contaminated by something like there is ammonia on the space station and the, if ammonia spills over then then you have a few seconds to to wear a respirator and then try to clean up the atmosphere, but they make you train on this one too. There are the control centers that are all over the place. There's one in Houston, one in Munich, one in Moscow, one in Japan, another one in Huntsville. So we all become a, like a family where you are actually dealing with people at the control centers, not just the astronaut on board. You actually trust these people there. They are able to tell you things that you don't know. Um, this is the, the, the space station. It's a picture taken 
uh, when the last shuttle left, uh, they took this picture to show the space station. This is the inside of the space station. This is the U.S. laboratory. Looks like uh, in order, right? Quite, almost. In fact, it's very in order. But what what kind of what happens when you are there and there is no more up or down is that you look at the procedure and they they ask you to you know go up on the ceiling and do something and you feel strange. So you you have to do something like this move up and you think god knows how i would feel going up there but then you actually go and have something strange happen is that the brain kind of turns the space station and what you feel is that the space station has changed and whatever is above your head is becomes the ceiling whatever you have below your feet becomes the floor which makes it an interesting situation because at the end uh, you're there to execute a procedure they will prepare a procedure so here the day and night cycles that you mentioned before we use gmt time so it's like you were in london by the way uh, start working at 7 30 in the morning and then you actually do a lot of things they want you to work so here we go you are a perfect engineer and what you do you do everything they need you they need to be done on the space station it would be you know, experiments, but will be also, uh, also, for example, exercise, because you need to maintain your body, because in microgravity, the skeleton gets dissolved. The density. For months, the density, there is a lot of problems. So there is a, a cyclergometer that can is used every day. Or one day the cyclergometer, one day the treadmill, and then there is one other exercise equipment, which is called the A-RED, which allows us to do uh, weight training in a place where there is no weight. Of course, you have to eat. Eating is kind of a kind of obligatory. We have a body. It's not you know, the best eat and the best food in the world, also because it has to be already uh, packaged. But then try to eat packaged lunch. I mean, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, every day for six months, you get boring. So at a certain point, I kind of complained with uh, one of the NASA, not complained, but kind of joked that there was no pizza. And sure enough, in the next supply vessel, they send up some pizza. So here we are showing the pizza that we had a pizza in space, exceptional pizza in space. But then, you know, there is a cultural problem here you know, they had a 20-ton supply vessel. And uh, how many pizza did they send? Can you see how many pizza? Four, four pizza. And how many astronauts? Six. Six. So four, as four pizzas for six astronauts with the 20-tons vehicle. You cannot figure this out. But if you talk to an American, kind of look at you like, you don't want to eat the old pizza. You just have a slice or something. Well, sorry, not for the Italians. You eat the whole pizza. No, not a slice. So... But anyhow, we had the pizza. Then, of course, you carry out the experiments. This is a fairly complicated one. And uh, see see when the station is kind of used, how complicated it can look. Like this is during a working day. It can get so complicated. But then, you know, you can do, uh, I don't know, experiments on plants or chemical experiments or on little satellites or on uh, uh, biotechnology uh, or uh, you can be the experiment. Uh, you can be the guinea pig because they are checking how the body works, what kind of gases you need, how much force you produce, what happens to your body. Here they are measuring the eye because some of the astronauts lost part of their vision. So, so they have to figure out what's going on if they want to send people to Mars. Uh, but here, so here I'm, I'm just completing two minutes, a complete... This is the one of my colleagues that is working on maintenance of the uh, life control system. So she's kind of a plumber. So you are you can be an engineer or a physicist or a medical doctor, but you're going to be a plumber because you cannot call Houston. Houston, you have a problem with the environmental control and life support system. Can you send a, pl a plumber? Guess who's the plumber? Or guess who's the electrician if something electrical doesn't work? Or guess who's the mechanic if something mechanic doesn't work? Or 
guess who's going to clean up if there is uh, to clean. And every week, there is at least four hours of cleaning to be done. And somebody of us has to take the vacuum cleaner and start vacuuming around. So this is the work of the astronauts. You, you end up doing all these things. And uh, it can happen something, some crazy day like this one. It was a day where Samantha had to talk to a school. But then, you know, when it was finished, she had to talk to the president of the Republic, then had to talk to the Pope, and then finishing taking care of the toilets. So the question is, which one is the most important of all of these things? No, you talk to the Pope, to the President of the Republic, to this and that, but the toilet is working. So that's that's the the that what matters exactly. Thank you so much. So now we have ten minutes for questions. If anyone has any, was it six thirty or six o'clock? They were finished. At six o'clock. Six o'clock. Okay. Yes. Sorry, then I made a mistake. It's okay. It's okay. Anyone? If uh, uh, down there. Yeah. So, hey, how can you say your name, please? Well, my name is Diego. I'm a third year physics student from UCL. I wanted to ask you how you dealt with personal space while you were up there. Personal space. Well, the space station is not that. Big and I have to say that when NASA designed the space station, they really did not pay much attention to personal space. Uh, they really pay attention to laboratories, technical stuff, and things like this. But then, you know, and in fact, for the first years, astronaut had no personal space. You know, you had your sleeping bag, you kind of hook up your sleeping bag to a place. And that was your space. But then they figure out that you need some kind of personal space where you leave your stuff. And so they built what is called the crew quarters, which is something like a, an old telephone booth, more or less. And so each one of the astronauts gets a telephone booth, crew quarters, which is your own personal space. So you want to sleep at night, you go in there, you close. It's not that big, but it's enough to give you your space, your computers, you can put your pictures, kind of joke saying you can put a picture of your dog, your, you know, uh, uh, spouse, uh, your mother-in-law, if you want, you know, this kind of things. And it's your space. And that's kind of good enough. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned before is uh, when, when they do this kind of... Uh, simulation hpp one of the things they look up they look at is uh, how you take care of yourself how you manage your stuff because on space station if you if you don't keep up with the order of where you put things you're going to have several troubles so if you're doing experiments and you use some tools and you don't put back the tools where they belong to people don't find them anymore and that is a problem. And that is a source of uh, conflict that starts immediately if you don't start uh, behaving in a certain way. And this is also part of your personal space. You know, your personal space is means also you should not infringe on other people's space. So it's easy not to go into somebody else's crew quarters but then you need to learn that when you do an experiment and you touch something, you put it back as it was so that people can find it. And uh, it's kind of an interesting situation. No? Okay. Thank you for your speech. Start, start, start again with your name. Thank you, Diego, for the question. Yeah. Thank you for your speech. My name is uh, Emanuele. Uh, I'd like to ask, like, what are your thoughts on the future of space exploration, considering like the advancement that the commercial um, companies such as SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Origin, and so on are doing? And um, that's the first question. The second one, space agencies. Okay. Okay. One second. Okay. Let me. 
uh, uh, yes, because you know my buffer is relatively small. So I, I can answer it with, with one minute with the fact that today we have what is called professional astronaut. They can fly on the crew dragon, not on the on the uh, uh, shuttle anymore to go to the International Space Station and do all sorts of things. But then you're right. We are in a moment where there are some what could be called space tourists that, you know, they take their luggage and go out. One a crew just came back a week ago with four space student, uh, tourists. Uh, in fact, it's possible today, it's possible today be a tourist by doing a, uh, what's called a kind of a parabolic flight, meaning go up, go out of the atmosphere and come back. And there is a, a flight with the Virgin Galactic, a blue origin that will take you in space. But also uh, there is Axiom, which is an American company, which is the one that just flew on the SpaceX and brings tourists to the space station. In the future, which is the question that, that you ask, so I, I said tomorrow, uh, what would be interesting is to do not a parabolic flight, but fly around Earth. This is what I think makes sense. And uh, so space station will be transformed or should be transformed, or there are talks to be transformed into private space station called Axiom Space Station from the name of the company. But there's also another company called uh, Sierra Space and Blue Origin. They made one partnership for a building a different space station called Blue Reef. So this is what is in place for the future. Um, okay, I will stop here. Um, maybe we can, There's there was someone else asking a question, so maybe we can do one. Oh. Yeah, just because we have like- Is there any other question? If there was like anyone who wanted to ask a question. Keep, 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 keep. I'll, I'll try to be quick and- uh, I think- do but do we have to leave the room at six or we can go a little bit? I think we can go a bit a little bit. Okay. Until so... maybe they kick us out if anyone just wants to ask questions. All right. Buonasera Paolo. Uh, I don't know if you recognize me, Enrico Vittori. Um I just was wondering about the difference, if there was any remarkable difference between training and flying with NASA compared with the Russians, other than the language. Yeah, Enrico, it's a it's an interesting uh, question because uh, the philosophy from the Soviets, Russian, and the Americans are different. But then you know you look at their vehicles; they are completely different. I think uh, the Americans like like we like we do like to over engineering stuff which means that they are they are looking at performance and they try to make to look at performance whatever is the cost but then like it happened with the shuttle they end up building vehicles that are difficult if not impossible to maintain a handle so they had to retire the shuttle the soviet or the russians still fly a vehicle that they built in the early 80s or 70s it's still the same vehicle with a little bit of, of changes. It's not comfortable. It's not the best vehicle, but but it works. So said that, uh, it's interesting because the Americans find out the problems and try to solve the problems with technical means. The Russian find the problems and try to solve the problems with smartness. So try to, to not to complicate the vehicle, make it as simple as possible. The American, as of today, don't have this philosophy. It's something that we should learn. I think there is something that we can learn from there. I, well, I Again, I teach a course at the Polytechnic in Milan. And one of the things that I tell my students all the time that they need to think, they need to make simplicity and reliability at the top of the characteristics and not at the bottom. There is a joke they say they used to run at NASA is, uh, do you know what is a, an elephant? 
And the answer is, it's a mouse designed by the NASA engineer. So we should try not to do that if possible. But there is there are definitely a difference between the things. Of course, the American performance is six o'clock. Thank you. The American performance are much better than the Russian. But I don't know. We need to find a way in the middle, probably. Uh, the mic. Liliana. Is it work? Okay. Uh, my question is, how does it feel to come back to Earth after, like mentally after a mission? Mentally. Well, physically, I would say it doesn't feel too good because uh, it's kind of strange. You don't feel, or normally you don't feel too well when you go from Earth to space. It takes a few days, weeks to get used to microgravity and things like this. But then, you know, there are certain things that are appreciable. So you can appreciate these things. For example, not having weight, being able to go wherever you want without being uh, without problems. Of course, things fly around, so there's a problem. But then you get used to this. So uh, when you come back to Earth, it's a problem because uh, you know you you find gravity. I think the the most complicated things for me was the fact that I felt I had an elephant on top of me, and. Uh, I, I I finally learned when I was in space not to feel my body. In fact, this is an interesting situation. If you stay a long time on the space station, you kind of forget you have your body because we do feel our body because of gravity. If there will be no gravity, we don't need the body and we will not feel it. And when you stay in space long enough, you forget about your body. But then you come back, you, you feel it again. And so the bones uh, miss some calcium, the muscles don't work properly, the vestibular system doesn't work. So it takes quite some time before you recover all of this. But then eventually you come back to, to being a human being. Um, and I don't know which one is the best uh, situation, being an extraterrestrial person or human being. I'm not quite sure. You know, when... When you are in space, you don't have a choice. You are an extraterrestrial person. So you, you better learn to take advantage of this situation. When you are on, on Earth, you have gravity and we use it to do a lot of things that we cannot do in space. So we need to look at what's possible in, uh, in the condition where we are and do the best out of it. Valeria, se non andiamo avanti qua... Sì. Oh, io non ho problemi, però... Um, I think we can keep going for, like, maybe just one more question, and then we'll finish it. One? I, I see three. So, what, oh, who, who had uh, their hands raised? One? No, so, I see three here, and then there is... Okay. I think we don't have a lot of time, because we already... Uh, the, got over is the... the police coming and chasing <laughs> us out? because we have, had, uh, we have... Eh? Okay. Okay. Um, tutte, facciamo tutte e tre insieme? Ah, if we, okay, possiamo fare tutte e tre? Basta che... Io non ho problemi. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks for your talk, Nicolò. Uh, I study here at the LSE. Um, since my background is more into uh, economics and, and politics, I was wondering, you talked a lot about flying from the USA and flying from Russia, and uh, I was just wondering, since the situation now is really tense, we could say, how does that influence uh, space collaboration between the two countries, for example, and also among astronauts who come from these two different countries? Well, I, I it's, it's out of question that from a political point of view, there is some kind of frictions between the Russians and the United States. Um, I would say that if you look at it from pure space point of view, from a technical guy, technical guys do not make any difference. So we are still in space. The space station is still running. There are still American astronauts. There are still Russian astronauts. Uh, we still work all together. Not simple because traveling is complicated, but it still work. And I would say that 
from a technical point of view, we do realize that things are complicated, but they are workable. It's the politics that makes it complicated and does not make it workable. So from a political point of view, there is some kind of, the friction is a political level, not a technical level. So I have no problem with the Russian cosmonauts uh, bump into them with them all the time and no problem. Um, hi, I'm Susanna. Um, I come more from an I background, and my question was more like, what do you think is what, the what background? Like, uh, international relations background. Um, so what do you think it's sort of related, but um, the future of European uh, human space flight, since you mentioned that they don't have, well, Europe doesn't have an independent um, human space flight capacity. Um, what do you think will be the future for Europe? That's kind of interesting question. I would wish the Europe would be a little bit more involved in space because right now, my opinion is that uh, the European Space Agency does a lot of things from a commercial point of view in terms of uh, satellite, uh, even technical satellite. But then, for example, we don't have any vehicle to launch astronauts if we are talking about you know going to the moon or going to mars we are we will be there as a partner but usually our percentage of of partnership is relatively low too low to count this is a problem in my opinion but hey i'm not a politic politician i'm not a, a manager of these things i would wish europe puts together all their capability and, for example, build their own vehicles uh, if possible. Um, but then, you know, so far we were never able to do it. I hope uh, it will. Or, or maybe we would uh, find an area of interest and specialize in that area. I don't know. It could be, you know, launchers or could be habitats or could be something significant where we give a contribution which is important to make to make our contribution value something on the partnership well i think that the panel is over now um thank you so much paolo for taking the time to Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come no, here. And I'm sorry, I thought I thought it would go until six thirty. For some reason, it's I okay. Don't... It's because we have um, another panel now with Letta. Uh, the building is perfect. So if you guys are coming, we'll see you there. All right. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you so thank much, you again. Paul. Thank you for coming. Thank you.